Good evening, everyone. I think we have people uh, Northern California, Southern California, lots of people joining us tonight. Thank you for checking in. We've got three really amazing, exciting guests tonight. We've got Anthony Zahn, retired Paralympian and extreme bike geek. He's owned a bike shop and uh, loves, what did you call yourself? An equipment fanatic, I think. Equipment junkie. We've got Jamie Whittemore, uh, ex terra girl, bike racer, Paralympi future Paralympian, and personality extraordinaire. And we've got Chris, our bike sponsor from Roaring Mouse um, Cycling. So Chris, thank you for being our sponsor and stepping up in a big way to help support our NorCal um, bike effort. Before we start, we're just gonna start with a short little video to give everybody a little motivation. So Naomi, let it roll. Quarantine, quarantine, man. Gotta go on a run, my boys, for sure. Let me text him. Hey, boys, when are we going on a run, though? Yeah, yeah. Let's do this. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
It's kind of a little bit geeky. You should be carrying it in the back of your jersey for cool. I don't like that. It falls on my neck. So you carry this beside your bottle cage. I like the design because it's entirely metal. It's not going to break on you. And it's old school. It has one of these that you might remember if you're older 50. Um, this allows you to pump away on your tire and not yank the valve out of your tube, which people do. So that's your pump. And lastly, actually, no, two things to go. Some people can do tires with their hands. I can, most can't. Tire levers. I use the Pedros. Oh, look. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> unbreakable, um, cheap, made from recycled milk cartons, I believe. So uh, a nice product. And then lastly, a little mini tool. Uh, this is really for when things go wrong or come loose. You're not going to work on your bike. Um, are you still there? I just got a low battery warning. Are you guys still there? You're good. Good? Okay. Um, this is really if things just come loose. You're not going to maintain your bike with it. It's an emergency. So a little tiny one works. Put it in your pouch. Or I like this one because it attaches to the bottom of your bottle cage. And then this thing just clicks in there. And the reason I like that is you've always got it. You don't have to remember you to put it in your bag in the morning. It's always on the bike. So I like the pump attaches to the cage, tool attaches to the bottom of the bottle cage. You've always got to get me home kit. So I think that for the, uh, for the single day, multi-day, I've not done any support on multi-day. Everything I've done has been very supported at night, which is, I believe is how you, how you guys run yours. You have a pretty good, set up for evenings, is that right? For, for me? Yes, is anyone who's run the ride, uh, the, the million dollar Million dollar ride, challenge. You're, oh, not yeah. look, you're not looking after yourself in the evenings and trying to get you ready the next day, you're pretty well hosted. Correct, we're pretty well hosted. And I mean, the only other thing I'd add is, is making sure that, like if you've got um, ETAP carrying an extra battery. Good one, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have totally run out of battery. To that point, Shimano will get you 1,200, 1,500 miles. Probably not a problem, but make sure you're charged. Yeah, SRAM, you could be changing the battery, so carry a spare. Right, right. And I can attest to, I have had the wrong tube, and I've also carried um, a valve extender in case mm -hmm. that ever happens again. And I've totally used a dollar bill for booting when I've gotten a slice or a gel um, wrapper. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Anthony, I'd like to ask you, uh, what do you think about these new e-bikes versus traditional bikes? I think the bikes are fantastic. <laughs> uh, my dad and I got a pair of e-bikes last February. He's what? Well, he's old enough to be my father. <laughs> he had a heart condition. Um, and uh, he's now riding quite a bit more than I am. He's riding his analog bike and his e-bike. Um, but, you know, they're, they're amazing for people who maybe want to try that charity ride that they keep hearing about but don't think they can quite do it uh somebody that wants to keep up with their spouse my wife loves my e-bike as much as i do because she no longer has to stop and wait for me <laughs> um, it's extended my range uh you know i was stuck doing rides within an hour and a half of home and you know that gets pretty limited pretty quickly i can now go when I'm able to leave the house and so on, uh, you know, I can go on three hour rides, four hour rides without too, too much trouble. Um, for someone like me, years back, uh, my, my condition is degenerative. Uh, so, you know, it's the e-bike has set me back 10 years younger. Um, but it's, again, it's, it's not just for someone with a medical condition or a disability. Uh, you know, 
you go to the start of any one of these charity rides and you see what looks like a bunch of fit cyclists and you wonder where's the rest of the population and one time at a ride we saw a family of something like six show up on rented e-bikes and i just went oh my god how are we not getting this getting more people on bikes like that uh you know we could be bringing all of the sunday football crowd uh out who thinks they could never do any of these rides get them out do the ride worst case you raise some money for charity but maybe you can get a few recreational cyclists out of people make some fans I, t I totally agree with you. I've seen more people on the MDC ride, which is, you know, seven days of riding along the coast of California and more people are able to do it and participate and help raise money because they have the option of riding an e-bike one of the days or all seven days. Right. So. Awesome. Thank you. And let's take it back to Chris. So I have been a mountain biker. I have raced cycle cross. I've also road raced and done many triathlons, but what's the deal with this new craze on gravel bikes? Like how is it different than say a cycle cross bike? And why is it such a big thing now? I mean, that's interesting. The name you did the bikes and the way you did it there is very interesting is that people still come in and ask for cyclocross bikes. And I have to clarify, well, what is the bike for? Um, because cyclocross bikes were used as gravel bikes for years because of the only machines that had tire clearance. You right. could run big puppy tires. Um, they were pretty um, awful gravel bikes because they were designed to ride around, around in small circles for 45 minutes. Not good for being out there three or four hours on more technical terrain. Um, Salsa claim to be the origin of it. I mean, the, the, the name was dormant for a couple of years, actually 10 years after Salsa folded. They came back with this idea of adventure by bike and it sort of sat fallow for three or four years. And about three years ago, all of a sudden it took off. And I honestly don't know why. And right now it's probably the hottest category out there. It's the bike you sell most of. If, and lastly, if you had to have one bike in San Francisco, it would be a ground bike. <laughs> so I should go get a gravel bike and add it to my collection. <laughs> I don't know, because you're a mountain biker at heart, I think, aren't you? Yes. Fun, and my, my, my wife put it, she said, okay, you take all that's fun about mountain biking and you remove it. And then you have gravel <laughs> riding. That was her <laughs> observation. It's long fire road climbs forever. Um, but coming from the other perspective, if you're coming in as a road biker, it's a total revelation. You're right. not around cars. You're out there away from people. It's more social than road riding because you stop and talk. Um, yeah. It's, uh, and I, I would say that the, the vast majority of my gravel riding friends and customers are road bikers who have adopted it and, and sort of now enjoy being away from cars, being away from tarmac and cities and being out in the country. <laughs> so I'll keep my 29er then and keep oh, God, ripping yeah. on that. Yeah. <laughs> I do love that. Thank you. And so Anthony, tell me, tubeless versus tubes. What do you think? Because I know, um, especially racing on the road and stuff that we both have had to have both. What do you prefer? Um, any, any specifics? Last two years, I have become a full tubeless convert. I am sold. I am in love with them. I wish I had them when I was racing. Uh, lower rolling resistance, uh, better comfort, potentially better grip in the corners. Uh, you can get a puncture, and the only way you know it is there might be just a little bit of sealant on the back of your bike at the end of the day. Um, as far as off-road stuff, mountain bikes and 
travel. Oh God, there's no excuse, no excuse. The only debate is on the road still. And I think the only reason there's a debate is because the road scene is so old and conservative and leery of new technology sometimes, <laughs> unless it's aerodynamics and lightweight. <laughs> We're a little bit nervous. Um, but, you know, worst case, you, you still carry a spare tube. If, if things go just absolutely bonkers sideways, uh, you put a new tube in and you're good to go. Um, mm -hmm. You can still get home. So yeah, I, I am sold. And this point is well made that we see the biggest barrier is people are scared of it. Right. They think, they think that, and the question is always, how do I get home? You say, well, you put a tube in it and there's this big aha moment. I think that is a, the barrier. So once you realize that it's a very simple fix, it's, then people adopt it. Yeah, if, if you get a bad enough puncture, you can put what we, a lot of us call a bacon strip in there. Same thing that's used to fix a car tire. Just a little plug. If you, know, if you get off the bike and maybe your sealant's not quite doing the trick, you don't quite have enough, Ideally, you find the puncture, put your thumb over it and save some of the air, get the little plug in there. And then if you have to, you can put a little more air in the tire and that's probably all you're ever gonna need to do. And then if that doesn't work, okay, fine. I'll pull over again and put a tube in it, but it's still good. Huh? <laughs> I swore by them in mountain biking. So I think it's a smart move to go towards that on the road bike as well. Absolutely. Thank you guys. So Chris, let me ask mm -hmm. you, how often should I be changing my chain, my rear cassette, um, <laughs> along with even lubricating my chain? Because I got to tell you, for many of my, much of my pro career, I um, had a partner that did all of that for me. So I never had to worry about it. But now that I've been racing as a Paralympic cyclist, it's something that I do need to pay more attention to. So can you help us out with, with that information? Um, change your chain more often than you think and lube your <laughs> chain less often than you think. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> if you get a chain, let me just take a step back, backwards. By, by changing your chain, what you're doing is changing it before it starts to damage your cassette and your chain rings. The chain stretches right. out the distance between the, it's actually stretched the, the pins elongate and it starts wearing the chain rings and the cassette to suit that new shape. And what happens is you get to a point where if you change one thing in the system, you have to change everything. So your $40 chain just became a $400 drivetrain. So change your chain more often than you think it's a disposable wear item. Um, your mileage might vary. You know, I'm six foot one, 205 pounds and a masher. So I will get through a chain faster than someone that is an accomplished road cyclist who can spin 90 RPM and isn't putting the load through the drivetrain that I am. Um, thousand miles, 1200 miles would be a good guide or you buy a little $20 tool that you can drop on the chain and it will tell you when it's time. And we, we each of those, we each have one of those at our workbenches here. And it is often bad news for a customer, unfortunately. They come in, chain skipping, you measure it. Oh, yep, you need to do everything. Lube, the, possibly the worst thing you can do to your bike, apart from jet washing it, is to over lube your chain. Because then it just picks up all the brake dust from the road, all the grit, and that becomes a grinding paste and that accelerates the wear, makes everything grind down faster, it shifts poorly. It leaves a mark on your leg, which is a bad badge of dishonor. Um, it's, you wanna run your chain a little drier than you think, and if you can, if you're so inclined, use a lube that you have to use every couple of rides. Um, rock and roll gold, I like. Um, and when you've lubed your chain, dry it off. You shouldn't be able to get it on your fingers after you lube the chain, you should lube it and then dry it off. That's right. one of the My biggest tips, yes. 
I was going to say our team mechanics always said you lube your chain at night, make sure you wipe it down and then ride tomorrow. Yeah, correct. You know, yeah. <laughs> well, who does that? <laughs> <laughs> I know, which is why my chain gets dirty and I have to clean it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So Anthony, what single upgrade will make you um, faster on the bike? Like what can you do? Oh, uh, get a bike set. <laughs> That's a good um, one. <laughs> make sure your bike fits you, uh, not just based on your height, but based on flexibility, injury history, um, riding style. Uh, beyond that, one of the most noticeable things is tires, especially if you have a brand new bike. A lot of Bike companies put less expensive tires on there uh, to save a bit of money, and they know that the tires are going to wear out soon enough. The customer's going to change them, and they're going to want, you know, they're going to go with the super puncture or the super light or what. Um, put some really nice tires on your bike. That'll make it feel like a new bike. Um, getting faster. Wheels, wheels are one of the classic things that makes a huge, huge difference. Uh, but it depends on where and how you're riding and your average speed. Um, aero wheels are always better until the uphill grade gets over 4%. That tends to be the break point that slows people down enough where lighter weight then becomes more important. Um, Another big deal, uh, get rid of the baggy clothing. Make sure your clothing <laughs> is snug. Um, baggy, you know, we're not MC Hammer in the 80s. <laughs> uh, <laughs> baggy does nothing except fight the wind. Um, and just maintain your bike. I was going to say a rule of thumb when I was in mountain biking, we always talked about rotational weight. So anything that spins, if you can lighten, so that would be like your pedals, cranks, wheels, as you mentioned, yep. tires and tires. stuff like that. It, it would, because in mountain biking, we're all about lighter. <laughs> we want the lightest bike possible. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you. What, what kind of bike so are you riding on the road that you're so not worried you about lighter weight? Oh, I am. I am. But I go back to like what I learned in mountain biking more so. I know. Well, road bikes are already so light. <laughs> Whereas mountain biking, sometimes they could come a little heavier. <laughs> but I do agree. I, li I like a light bike. Um, <laughs> but Chris, so my shifting seems off. What are some on the road adjustments? that I can maybe do to smooth things out without making it worse. And I know this will depend upon whether you have mechanical shifting or electronic shifting, because I got to tell you, I've recently been learning how to adjust my ETAP. So if you can help out maybe based on all three of those things, Shimano electronic, ETAP electronic, and then mechanical. Okay. I'm going to add one thing to the last question what you can do to okay. make your bike go faster. I've got a $50 thing you can buy for your bike that will make you really fast. <laughs> a pump with a pressure gauge. <laughs> I know how many people we have come into our shop or people I've had on group rides that have got absolutely no idea they have to inflate their tires. And they're running 30, 40 PSI. Uh, we're addressing a more experienced group Kia, so maybe not as relevant, but that's the biggest thing I found on. I actually started doing it on group. I said, go around and like actually check your tires because you're just going to be working hard for no reason. I'm putting that one first because the second question is a hard one. Uh, and my honest right. answer to is if you are on a ride and your derailers are misbehaving, ask around. Does anybody know what they're doing? Because um, adjusting a derailer can vary from complicated but if you follow the right steps you'll get it right to alchemy front derailers are alchemy 
they're not science. Um, the reader is usually what goes out and the one that you can have more chance of being able to address. And I'll start with mechanical. Um, on the back of that derailleur, and I wish I had one in my hand. I wish I thought about this. Oh, maybe I do. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Look what I got. Just happened to have one. On the back of every derailleur, there's this little barrel shaped thing. And it's easy to work out how to use it. If you're shifting and it won't shift towards the wheel, it's hesitant to go towards the wheel, turn the barrel one click towards the wheel. If it won't shift away from the wheel, turn it one click away from the wheel. That's your adjustment. These two very tempting screws right here that everybody immediately reaches for when they adjust the derailleur, don't Can touch you lift them. lift it up a little? Oh, sorry. There you go. So that's your barrel adjuster. Turn it towards the wheel to get it to move towards the wheel. Turn it away from the wheel to get it to move away from the wheel. These two very tempting screws here, don't touch them. These are called limit screws. Okay. They, stop, they stop you putting your derailleur into your wheel, which could be a very expensive, loud crunch, a ride ending crunch. So these look tempting, don't touch them. This barrel is what you adjust. The B tension screw real quickly is a third screw there that often sticks out some. And a lot, a lot, a lot of people want to tighten it all the way in so it's yep. not sticking out. They don't like screws <laughs> hanging out. Yep. The screws are supposed to be hanging out. Yeah. Leather. Yeah. The point is well made. These three screws here are set when the bike is built. And really, you shouldn't have to touch them unless you change something on the bike, like a new cassette or a new wheel. Right. This is your adjuster. DI2 is still way more common than SRAM. And that's done by wherever you plug your charger, there's a button. If you press and hold it, a red light comes on and stays on. That means you're in adjustment mode. And it's somewhat easier than mechanical because if it's not shifting towards the, the shift you do with a small lever, just click the small lever. And it will adjust a little bit towards that. If it's not shifting to the big cogs, it's not moving on the big, the big lever, touch the big lever, it will shift a little bit that way. And then once you're done, press and hold the, ch the button right where you charge it, and that red light will go off. Right. Uh, ETAP, I have absolutely no experience in. <laughs> There's little buttons on a road bike. There's little oh, buttons yeah. on the yeah. lever. And then that's what you that hold and you, and, you key, and you tap very lightly in, either, in the direction that it's not shifting or you're having trouble if it's ghost shifting. And then that's how you do that one. Oh, right. I recently learned that. <laughs> and actually, one of my uh, guys here just leaned over and said, crash mode. <laughs> that's a common, you seem to have had some experience with this. Um, that's a common mode on DI2 where someone knocks your bike over. You go stop for a coffee and like, oh crap, you knocked my bike over. You get back on the bike and you try and shift and nothing happens. Right. The machine turned itself off. It, it goes into a mode where, you, where it won't damage itself. And you simply cycle that little button I talked about right by the charging port, turn it on so the red light comes on, press it to the red light goes off, then you're fine. We get that question pretty often. Usually if on the road, someone's stuck. Nice. The key is go into the bike shop and ask how. <laughs> well, and then they can show you. Yeah. There's, if you're on a group <laughs> ride, there's usually somebody that kind of knows it more than you do and and even with flat tires my, my my wife cannot change a flat tire but she carries the kit so if she gets stuck right. somebody will help will help her because she has the gear even if she doesn't have the knowledge or the willingness right i absolutely agree with that when i first started learning some 20 years ago that that's exactly what i did i had the chain breaker i had everything and so if i ever broke down on a trail someone always came by and was able to help and then i just started learning because i didn't want to have to wait <laughs> <laughs> yep cool thank you and so i have another question what is the greatest new product that you've seen this year and that can be out of bikes uh, or apparel, but like, what's kind of the coolest thing? I know it's been a really weird year. <laughs> I'm going to hide the manufacturer because I don't want to be plugging, but there we go. The red color will give it away. 
these guys, for the kind of riding that we're advocating right here, multi-day, long days in the saddle, get in the right saddle. And this new one, the Mimic, and the Power have been huge. They, this one came out of the sort of triathlon time trail world and then just works so well. People have got it on their mountain bikes, they've got it on their gravel bikes, they've got it on their road bikes. And then the Mimic is a brave move and this, I won't get too gynecological here, but this pattern that was becoming well promoted and bought for relieving pressure doesn't work for women. Everything ends up getting pushed in there and it's not fun. So a system was developed that has a soft area versus a hole. And that's about where I'm going to stop on that because I don't want to get too precise. But um, <laughs> in terms of a product for the kind of riding that you guys are going to get in, going to be promoting and organizing long days and saddle a damn good saddle is what you want yeah i i fully agree but i must be weird because i actually like the cutout i like it on my mountain bike my right. road bike my tt bike i have to have that especially now with a leg discrepancy being a a challenged athlete myself that even yeah. the leg discrepancy it helps me to have the cutout would you also say um like chamois are pretty important yes. because yes. <laughs> when i started i have to say when i started the bike shop that i went to sold me a man's pair of chamois and it was so wrong because men's chamois and women's chamois are totally different so tell us what some good chamois uh. would be there's no one good chamois except spend as much as you can and get a pair of bibs. Um, we, we run a team out of the shop here and the worst job in that team is running the kits and it's because of the chamois. And that, t that job title given to themselves is kit bitch because they get slapped around by everybody's particular opinion. So, and it's the same with the saddle and the cutaway is, is, Work out what works for you and then stick with it. Don't follow somebody else's advice because they haven't got your butt. You got your butt. So if you, <laughs> I mean, a lot of Martin guys ride women specific saddles. Right. It works for them. It's not what the marketing people would have them do, but it's what works for them. So in, in work out what works for you. Put a lot of money into your shorts, especially. Put you know, put three times into your shorts what you put into your saddle. Um, get bibs. Wash them. Don't put them in the dryer. Oh my gosh, right. And have enough, and have enough <laughs> pairs that you can cycle through them and not have to keep. Don't ever wear them a second time. Nope. <laughs> you can oh, go off and mow the lawn down. and trim the hedges. Go in, take a shower, and put the same underwear <laughs> back on. No. Um, go commando. No undies. Yep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so many people just can't deal with that, but the shorts are designed to keep seams out of awkward places and made of materials right. that are specifically made to keep you dry, neither of which undies are good at. Um, and then there's chamois cream. Use chamois <laughs> yeah. cream. That yeah. is your friend. It will help prevent chafing and a lot of them are antimicrobial, yeah. which prevents other issues. Um, and just use it preventatively. Nobody likes that. On the, on, the chamois cream, on the chamois cream thing, people are reluctant to use it because it's kind of weird. But when I used to read, lead the, uh, uh, the uh, back when it was AIDS, AIDS ride, now it's a life cycle. Um, day one, day two, day three, we're standing out there with buckets of it. Nobody's using it. Day four, there's a line. <laughs> people are getting piss poles <laughs> down the shorts it goes because it works. <laughs> It, it really does. And I, when we do the MDC ride, I tell everybody from day one, use it before you need it because yes. it will, will make it to where you never need it. And every stop I am applying chamois cream. If it's a, a snack break or if it's a um, lunch break, like I am reapplying because we're on it. We're on the bikes anywhere from, you know, four, to like six and a half, seven hours. <laughs> great 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 advice so let's move on especially during this time where so many people have been stuck inside or maybe 
um, time is limited because you work. And so the sun is not up when you wake up or the sun goes down before you get home, but it forces us to have to train indoors. So what, um, and, and I want both of you to address this and tell me what you think, but, um, Chris first, maybe what, um, what kind of trainer do you recommend is best out there? The best kind of smart trainer. What is the difference between say a smart trainer versus just a regular trainer, a dumb trainer? Right. Yeah. The, the simple and facetious answer is any trainer you can find because they are sold out everywhere right now. So you may have to do a lot of searching. All of, all of our wholesalers are sold out, getting phone calls all the time, people trying to find them because you're right. It's the only thing we can do right now. Um, what kind of trainer? A smart trainer, definitely. And a smart trainer is one that will talk to your phone or a laptop and allow you to um, measure your performance, um, monitor how you're doing. And particularly a trainer that has resistance built into it that can be changed by your phone and computer. So we were talking earlier, the experience is you don't just get on the trainer and change the gears until you feel you've got the right resistance for now. The trainer sets the resistance for you. So it becomes a coach. It will, it will warm you up at you know, 9,500 watts. You'll take it to 130, you'll take it to 220, and it will hold you there, and it will even yell at you. I've, my, I, Zwift every now and again will, will in uppercase letters, swear at you if you're not doing your job so it becomes this thing that is kind of geeky but in the big picture it gets you engaged in something that's very very hard to remain engaged in i've spent a previous year after a serious injury in a trainer and that was very very difficult this year i got back on a trainer with dread because i damaged my shoulder discovered smart trainers and a training program and now i kind of enjoy it What about you, Anthony? Uh, I, with, with my condition, I've got fatigue such that uh, I've only got the energy to get on the bike three days a week and live in, in a good week. And living where we do, I don't really need to get on the trainer anymore. Um, I am intrigued by things like Zwift and the idea of a smart trainer and, you know, again, the equipment junkie in me would love to try it, mm -hmm. but I'd really also sort of rather go right outside right now <laughs> if I can. Um, we were talking earlier and, you know, if you can leave a bike set up on a trainer in an area uh, of the house that makes it so much easier to get on you don't have to have all of the kit and all of the stuff and if you forgot something you run back out to the other room and get it um, you know you can get more water you can get more chamois cream you can get your food or answer the phone if you have to um, if you can leave a trainer set up in a specific location um, our trainers are nuts. There are a couple of them I have read about, I've never tried, but that apparently replicate road feel even, like bumpy roads or cobblestones. Uh, so if you want to go race the pros at Perry roubaix uh, you can imagine it and put it on your big screen and go do it. Um, so they are, they are pretty neat. Uh, I'm curious, but just don't really have the energy for myself right now. I, I personally have, have used the Wahoo kicker for, I want to say about three years now, and it does have the attachment for your front fork that can simulate climbing. Um, and I do, I enjoy it when I have to be stuck inside because the weather's bad or maybe I can't leave my kids or something like that. Um, I, I do enjoy it. I do enjoy that it will push me. Um, I can do testing on it and all that data can go to my coach. Um, we were earlier talking about different programs. Um, have you guys 
hooked up on with Zwift and, and done, cause there are different programs out there that can also connect to the trainers. For instance, you can use Sufferfest, which is a pure, um, hard workout, going to kick your butt for like an hour, hour, 15 minutes, or you can use something like Zwift where you hop on and you get to ride with people around, around the world essentially, or right next door. But you're not what do you guys think about those programs with with the trainers? Uh, I, thought, I think it depends or, on you know what you want to be more recreational. Yes, Frankie had to make an appearance. You want to be more recreational, like on Zwift, where you have the option of chatting with friends, or are you on the trainer for performance gains and you're gonna do what your coach tells you hang the weather uh, <laughs> you know so ask around about the applications of each of the various programs right it's certainly a, when I listen to the or read the email list from our race team hardcore tends to go to suffer fest but um, Zwift is is it is definitely something that can get you sucked in because it's social. You can just go for a ride. Um, the worlds you ride in are extraordinary. Um, in a past life, I was an architect. I lived in London. I'm riding around London in Swift. I ride past a building and go, I worked in this area. There's a building here I worked on. And there it was. And it was recognizable. <laughs> so the worlds you ride in are extraordinary. But then you can push it to, okay, I've got an event in three months here's my goals and you can set a training program where it will make you work it will make you work if you if you set it up but certainly the main appeal is it can get people riding trainers that have previously found them insufferable right i think the other really cool thing that i'm noticing and i know specifically my team team 20 20 and also the U.S. Paralympic cycling team has been doing rides where anybody can join. So now you can ride with pros um, that will make guest appearances in these either races or just regular rides. And so you essentially can be sitting on your bike in your living room or on your deck and be racing next to Chloe Diger. And I think that's fantastic. That's a neat way to kind of very much engage at a time when we kind of all feel alone. <laughs> Yep, yep. Yeah, that's awesome. Do you have a recommendation for a specific smart trainer? Because I only have experience with the Wahoo, the Wahoo, and the Wahoo Kicker, and I know there's um, some other ones out there. Do you have any recommendations on what's I mean, better? I I have the Wahoo. I have the middle one. Um, they all work very, very well. I don't feel you should be spending a huge amount of money on forks that go up and down, etc. Um, a cheap fan will, will be a 20% of the price of the, of the Wahoo fan. Um, anything with a big flywheel, anything that's heavy, anything that costs a hundred bucks to ship is going to be good because you need something really, really heavy to get a decent road feel. Um, beyond that, realistically right now, it might be just whatever you can get because we've, I've been in that situation where customers have called and say, I want a trainer and I'm on my various wholesalers b2b's just searching for anything that's a smart trainer um that's shippable right it's kind of like hair clippers i went into target to buy hair clippers they're all gone <laughs> so we have reached our time of q a and i actually have some very specific questions that people have asked and the first one, um, Anthony, I'm wondering if you can answer this. It says, uh, do you have any advice for different pedals, cleats, cages for a road bike? I have cerebral palsy, so I have to cycle with bilateral AFOs. Um, so he's struggling to get used to cleats and not sure. Uh, Jamie, your hotspot got medium. <laughs> Uh, but yes, uh, okay, bilateral ankle foot orthotics and cleats. I would look at Shimano or Look. Um, 
those tend to be the most stable and the most uh what they give you the most feedback about whether you're in or not um they're a very solid entry and release and it's kind of counterintuitive at first but i would set the tension i do set the tension as high as i can get it for the entry and release right. and it's never all that much harder to get in but you don't want to come out of the pedal unintentionally. Um, I have crashed when I've blown a pedal, but I've never crashed because I couldn't get out. Um, so any, the more expensive look pedals tend to have uh, higher entry and release tensions. Uh, I'm not sure about the tension range across Shimano, but yes, absolutely. Go clipless, do something good, and set the tension high, and then practice until it's second nature. And don't definitely, give up. definitely. I wear an AFO on my left leg, and Shimano is what I use, and I do have to use um spacers in them i know specialized makes them and i and there's another company that makes them as well because since i can't point one foot but i can point the other and shimano's worked great just like you said anthony i tighten up the one so that i never clip out <laughs> accidentally because it's bad it's bad when we do <laughs> great 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 advice you can, you can always get out really easily by putting straightening your leg and then twist from your hip. And you'll get more leverage there than you ever thought you possessed. <laughs> I have to use my hand because it's that bad on the, on the left side. <laughs> but I can clip well, out on the right. <laughs> your hip is where you had the issues. So your upper leg. And <laughs> exactly. No, that's really, really great, great advice. Chris, can you share with us some places in... Marin, that you might uh, ride a gravel bike. I know the last time I was there, I got kicked off some trails that were for hiking. <laughs> yeah, the, the key to that is you buy the, um, the Marin Bicycle Coalition map because that only shows where you can go on bikes. It doesn't even show the footpaths, so you can't possibly get it wrong. Um, the general rule is anything that's fire road is open which is great because that's gra gravel territory. Uh, everything that's single track is closed, um, except for very specific places like Tamarancho and China Camp, which are single track. So riding from the city, I'd go over the bridge, climb halfway up Hawk Hill, take the single track that goes off the roundabout and just head north as far as you want to go and, and then turn back. Um, the beauty of that, is when I've guided and told other people how to ride up there is if you get it's a series of ridges as you as you head further north you're climbing descending climbing descending climb you can get yourself to a point where I've got five ridges to get home I am tired turn east hit pick up the bike path ride home so you can sort of take a little bit of a risk and get yourself a little further out than you thought you might want to be and you bail out as you just head towards the bay pick up the north south artery and just back to San Francisco you come Awesome, because I hear there is going to be a, a, a gravel component in the MDC ride this year. So be a good idea to get out and try it out. <laughs> um, I do have another question. Anthony, you had talked earlier about an important thing about getting a bike fit, which I 100% agree when it comes to the road bike, because it's just, it's just so much more comfortable when you are fit properly on the bike. What is a good price range um, to spend on a bike fit? A uh, couple few hundred dollars, but I'm kind of out of that loop. So I'm going to defer to Chris on that. Chris, 300? 300. Yeah. 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 You know, price, price of a pair of nice cycling shoes. So it, it seems high when you first contemplate it, but when you look at, hey, that's, you know, four high end tires or a pair of cycling shoes. It's, it's not extraordinary, it comes into what we put into our bikes. And as you're observing here, it's probably the best thing you can do. Give you more reward right. than a pair I, of you know, upgrading your shoes or buying a new pair of tires. Yeah, 
I 100% agree. I spend money on making sure that I am fit properly to each one of my bikes. And the really good guys will take the time. Uh, They will do either video or they'll hook you up to different things. Um, You know, I mean, like go to a guy that specifically fits, fits people on bikes. Don't just roll in to someone that doesn't necessarily know what they're doing. Um, And do remember that fit is dynamic. It's you get a bike fit. That's not your permanent fit forever. You're going to get injured. You're going to lose fitness and flexibility. You're going to gain fitness and flexibility. Um, So anytime you go through any big physical change is a good time to get a fit or every couple few years. Yeah. Definitely. Right. Uh, like there's like two sides. One is for a, for a limited period of time. Once you've been fitted, say to a road bike, you can use those dimensions if you get a new bike, for example. But you're right. If you're two or three years later, things change. Get it redone. Um, back to an earlier point. Um, fit has been pushed the last three or four years as a big profit center for bike shops. So beware of the fitter that's been doing it for six months. Uh, the guy that used to be on the sales floor and has been trained in fit. Try and find somebody that has a resume that includes, um, they've done coaching, they've done long-term involvement in fit, not just something the boss has to get trained up on this, this year. So do look at people's backgrounds when you're picking a fitter. Yes. Uh, right. I remember, 100% agree with that. And remember when you're, paying a bunch of money for a fit if you've got a good fitter they've been through some amazing training to be able to assess your flexibility your range of motion uh and they're not just you know asking how tall you are check your inseam and look at a formula uh this is something that's very very specific uh you know they're checking both ankles for flexibility, your arches, uh, your shoulder flexibility. Um, and like I said, injuries, history, um, so that they can then set the bike. So it's comfortable for you. You know, you don't make yourself fit the bike, make the bike fit you. (laughs) hundred percent agree with that. Um, We have a little bit of time left and I just wanted to ask each one of you, maybe Chris first, like, how did you get into bikes? Ah, How long do you have? It's a long (laughs) step. The short, the the short, short like two, three minute version. Um, Short version. (laughs) I grew up very poor. I grew up without a bike. I moved around a lot. Single parent mom moved to a town where every kid had a bike and I didn't. And the local kids adopted me and we went around everybody's garages and we found enough pieces to put together a bike for me. And so that was the origin of me on bikes. Um, I road raced through my teens, um, had way more bikes than I could afford because I knew the local bike shop guy. And so I had to do all my own (laughs) maintenance. I learned to sew up tubular tires you're told you can't do it. You can if you have to. Um, so I learned through having to do it. Um, and then moved to California many years later, took up mountain biking and met my wife on a mountain bike. Um, my whole friend group was around bikes and I decided to start a shop so I could meld Monday to Friday with Saturday and Sunday and make the whole thing one piece. That's fantastic. What about you, Anthony? Oh my. Uh, let me see. I think I did my first, took my first bike maintenance class when I was about seven. Started working on my bike, which probably cost us a lot of money. Um, started racing bikes between freshman and sophomore years in high school. Yeah, there we are. That's a little thing. <laughs> Kids. Uh, that's my brother and I in France in 95 that's more recent Um, started racing in high school I think I raced 23 years over a 25 year period 
And along the way, I also spent eight years as a custom frame builder and I owned a bike shop for 14 years. And then uh, in 2005, I ended up making the, uh, that's one of the frames I built there, uh, my mountain bike. Um, ended up making the developmental team on the US Paralympic cycling team in 05 and made the elite team in 07. There's my brother racing when he was uh, 11 at the Redlands Classic. Uh, <laughs> So he's, he's been racing for 30 years now. He still races a bit. Um, that's one of my favorite jewels. That's another one I built there. Oh, that's the history of Arrow. The hooker elite. Um, God, I'm a geek. Anyway, uh, so yeah, I raced with you. There's me on my e-bike at the Marine Century. Uh, raced for a while and then retired in 2014. Those are my first two bikes I ever built. There I am in London with a one-legged guy behind me. <laughs> He's actually less disabled than me, but whatever. My, my legs are at least very aerodynamic, right? <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much. Um, I guess I could share a little bit about how I got into bikes too. Um, gosh, when I graduated college from being a runner, I wanted to do triathlon. So I went to a bike shop, bought a bike, started doing triathlon, met my ex-husband at that bike shop and got me into mountain biking. And that's when I discovered Xterra, became a pro in that, and then also started racing pro mountain biking. So... <laughs> Then got cancer and became a Paralympic athlete and joined the U.S. paracycling team, which is where I met Anthony. So I still mountain bike when I can. Um, you know, I love it. Love racing around the world and love doing the MDC ride. <laughs> so it's been, it's been a lot of fun. I've met a lot of amazing people over the years. But I want to thank you guys so much for uh, answering all these questions and to everyone out there who joined us this evening, and I'm going to turn it back over to Lotta. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. It's been so much fun riding on the MDC with you for the last few years. I mean, we have hopefully one coming up shortly. Thank you, Anthony, and thank you, Chris, for all your uh, energy and input and answering all these bike geek questions that we've all been wondering about and afraid to ask. So it was really fun. It was really great. Next Thursday is our last uh, part podcast in this series of four. Next Thursday, we'll talk about community and what it'll look like and how we can join up and stay together as a community in this new normal that we're experiencing. And we'll have one of our other sponsors, Helen from Equator, will be joining us. And Dean, who is the co-chair of the Million Dollar Challenge. Both, of, both, both two people are the people that I know that's been excellent at building community and everything they do. So I'm really excited to have a conversation with them next week. So join us same time, same place next week. And thank you, all three of you for um, sharing the evening with us. It was really great. Thank you. And see everyone thank next you. week. You're welcome. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.